Hi, welcome back to our last presentation for the day. It's a great honor to have with me the new CEO of Maha Energy, Ketil Sulbreke. So I'll leave the word to you and then I'll come back in the end with some Q&A. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for uh, again hosting me and uh, welcoming me here. It's a great pleasure always to be here. How long am I going to be a new CEO? I, I wonder, I mean, is that for another month? Or is <laughs> <laughs> I start to feel comfortable in my, <coughs> in my job at least. So, but thank you for, for the introduction. So I will, I will basically take you to, uh, through uh, where we are now. A lot of things is happening in uh, Maha. Uh, it's a company that uh, you still can recognize from what it was, but I think it starts to be more and more difficult. And I think we are uh, of course, proud of, of uh, our uh, uh, new direction, and we believe uh, very firmly that we can produce, reproduce a bit of what we did with 3R in uh, in Brazil. So I'll come back to that. Obviously, the going through the, the obligatory uh, disclaimer. Uh, this is a bit of my background since I've been there before. I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on this. I I done my service in the in the for the Norwegian state, uh, working for the, for the Ministry of Oil and Energy in Oslo, and uh, was later working with Hydro, Equinor, been CEO in Panoro, uh, in Sintef, in Brazil, and, and then we started up DBO and they created 3R. And, uh, the, and uh, actually, I should have Ma here as well. But, um, you see, things are happening fast. So I want to start really by talking a bit about our or I could almost say myself, uh, my journey, uh, starting DBO uh, back in, started in 2016. Uh, and to be very honest, it was uh, we're out with two good friends and we were drinking beer. And we thought that, you know, it should be, somebody should start an oil company now because it's a fantastic time for, for Brazil. Nobody else believes in Brazil. We thought that we could see something is really happening here. It had been uh, the most, the, the largest corruption scandal that has ever uh, been seen, yeah, uh, disclosed in the world was basically then disclosed in Brazil, called Lava Jato. And we thought uh, something will happen and Petrobras think that they have to sell assets and we can participate because very few can actually have the courage to, uh, to go into this uh, game right now. So that's, that's the background. That was why we started up DBO. We got support from a German company, RWE, not unknown, and they have the private equity arm, and uh, we got money from them. Uh, and uh, make a long story short, we made an IPO, and we worked together with Starboard. That was the a key thing, and that was the time we started our collaboration with Starboard. We made uh, the first uh, 30 million dollar investment into 3R. Uh, it was 40 percent of the first investment, and uh, Starboard did the other 60 percent. Uh, they were private equity. We were, we, with especially my background, uh, more in oil and gas, uh, uh, yeah, alibi if you like it, in, in the collaboration. And, uh, and together we formed 3R. Uh, RWE sold out after two years, uh, making the, from their $30 million, making more than $100 million uh, out of that investment. And 3R today is a company that has a value of more than two or about $2 billion uh, listed in, in Brazil. And it's the 10th largest company in Brazil, all created in five years. So that's a fantastic story. I've been in the board of 3R. I'm still in the board of 3R Offshore. I've been in the board since the very beginning of its, uh, its start. So when the Germans, uh, our friends in, in RWE left, we were uh, basically uh, able to keep the rest of the company, which is then, we don't have much fantasy, so we started DBO2. <laughs> and uh, so DBO2 had then a fantastic also journey where then we had uh, the Perua field and uh, Malombe, which we already had the 50% of. And then we, we joined forces with, uh, with Starboard again and 3R and created 3R Offshore. And our participation now in 3R Offshore has been merged into uh, Maha Energy as the DBO deal. So I know the assets very well. Uh, I have been the first one in the data room in both assets. I know exactly what the challenges are and what the potential is. And I think at least in Perua, we have realized a lot of it already. Uh, much more to come on the production. And in Papatera, we are about to, to do the same. 
So please, uh, any questions there is fine. I think we have already covered this. Of course, the, the latest thing is the exciting uh, startup in Venezuela. And I must say, when Starboard was so keen to, to start up this in Venezuela, it was also now a startup uh, with acquiring Maha. It was already then that we discussed that uh, this could work for us also as a platform for what we think is going to come in Venezuela. So Venezuela isn't just a lucky shot that we have done, you know, desperately over the last week. It's something that has been prepared for more than a year. That's it's important. So we, we, we know what we are doing. It has been well planned. And uh, that's why we already have people on the ground in Venezuela. So a little bit where we are today. That, as I said, it's been completely reshuffled the whole company. I think there are only two people left uh, in the company uh, compared to, uh, you know, that was there a year ago. Uh, so we have new people and we have a quite new portfolio. There are some old uh, uh, parts of the portfolio left uh, with Illinois. We are drilling three wells. Uh, I visited uh, them uh, just some months ago. And uh, I ha actually have good expectations to the wells, but I'm not going to talk a lot about it. It's not strategic important for this, but I think they're going to give us a nice uh, addition on the production in January, February next year. Then we have one. And to make a long uh, winding road uh, talk very slow, I'm not going to say uh, much about Oman. We will send the press release, uh, I think, next week about our next steps. And I think, uh, yeah, don't be too, uh, don't have too high expectations, to put it that way, for the press release. I think that's not a big surprise anyway. But uh, uh, I would say I still kind of liked uh, like Oman. I think uh, it's. The challenging thing is really very strict deadlines, very difficult to, to, uh, to change any regulation or to get some, some sense of feedback from the, from the ministry. So obviously what we try to do is to try to maximize the value of what we have there. And, uh, and, uh, and yeah, that will be press release next, uh, next week. What we see here also then, we have uh, then Perua, Papatera, I will talk about those assets. And then you see, of course, the, the potential influence of, of the, what we have done today, just with the 24% of the Pedro Raneta. So it's a, it's a game changer. It's a company maker uh, type of uh, investment, uh, which could end up have the value of much more than, than what the company uh, is today and uh, the other assets uh, uh, has uh, of value today in the company. So of course we're going to spend most of the time on Venezuela. Looking here at the time, I thought that I thought it was important in a way to take you a bit through this story of what we have done, what we have done in, in Brazil, and because we think that this is actually a sort of it's never you can never say that okay just copy and paste because they're two different places and so on. But there are very much very similar situations these two countries are in, and it's a very similar kind of. Uh, um, assumptions from other people around, if you like, you know, they're, they're like, ah, how, how do you have the courage again? Uh, how do you manage? How can you do it? And so on. Well, this is what we have planned for for a long time. And we, we plan together with Starboard in Brazil. And I'm very confident that we can do the same here in Venezuela. So <coughs> Venezuela at, uh, you know, uh, on, on, the, on the quick glance, uh, on the macro picture, it's uh, the most resource rich country in the world, more resources than uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, enormous uh, oil uh, resources in the country. Uh, a bit ridiculous because they have s small production numbers. They have like a reserve lifetime of 1,000 years. So that means they can continue to produce uh, 0 0.6 uh, uh, million barrels per, uh, per day for 1,000 years. And God, I hope that's not going to be the case. So uh, <coughs> that would be disappointing. So this is well, what we have uh, bought into. Uh, I come a bit back to how the structure of the deal is and so on, but this is in the west part of Venezuela. It gives some challenges because the power production is on the east side of the country. And this means there are lots of outages, there is lots of, of problems with energy supply. So one of the things we need to fix in this field is basically to, to put in gas turbines that we, we can become independent of the gas grid, of the electricity in the grid. There are lots of other challenges here. I won't you know, even start mentioning everything, but there are problems like because the country has been in the situation they have been, they have dug up pipelines and sold them as scrap. 
They have robbed processing stations or most of the equipment in processing stations, but there are bits and pieces here that are functioning. And what we will do is not to start on the project how to fix everything. No, we will fix a batch here, we will fix another batch there, we will go into this and fix it gradually. And so that's that we can immediately start having a positive uh, return, po cash flow from things we fix on the, on the short notice. So I hope to have production already in 2024, but of course, depends on getting approvals and all these things. Everybody's super positive, but somebody has to write the documents and sign them so before we can start. But I think it's, the, of course, it goes without saying, there's a lot of reserves. They have only produced 16% of what is a total oil in place volume of 8.6 billion barrels. So on, only increasing the recovery factor with 1% gives you 80 million barrels. You know, so uh, there, there is, you, you know, there, it's an, it is not possible to think that you're not able to get more oil out of this, uh, out of this reservoir and much more oil out of this reservoir. But again, I think the key focus for us in the beginning is much more per well much more uh, how much uh, per day we can increase the production. Today, 1,000 barrels. I'm most not concerned with getting it to 3, getting it to 5, getting it to 10, getting it to 15, getting it to 20, then looking at how can we monetize 500 million barrels, because then you become blind. Then you start on, on crazy numbers with CapEx and so on, so we are not going that way. But of course, in the long run, I think there will be several of these projects and there is plenty of things to work with. So we can keep on copying this 10,000, 20,000 and so on. I think it's going to be interesting. Okay, this I think I already talked about, uh, just highlighting the story history here. This started to produce uh, when my uh, <laughs> grandfather was a young man. So uh, this helped the Americans uh, have uh, gasoline for the war and so on. So, uh, so these are old assets. They were prime assets in 1945 and 50. And, uh, but the good thing about that also, which is interesting, is that with 16% recovery factor, it's not because it's heavy oil, it's actually 15 to 35% um, API. So it's fairly light oil, it's a good reservoir, uh, so they can have this kind of pro productivity. So they had wells here that was one of the most productive wells in, in, in the world at the time. So, but it's just been depleted. So basically, one thing is thinking long term, how can you get some more energy into, into this? Maybe you have an old type of stripper wells concept from the US, but there are ways to get this oil out and we can get uh, you know, a lot more oil out also in the long run. Uh, this is the team already uh, on the ground, uh, Javier uh, Gremes Cordero. Uh, I worked with him now for, for half a year. Fantastic uh, experience. He's been country manager for Petrobras in Venezuela. He knows the people. Uh, we are already having Venezuelans, which is on the lower line here, uh, working in uh, Maracaibo, working in Caracas uh, with ourselves. And, uh, and are ready to take them positions into these uh, mixed companies or, or whatever way we're gonna, we're gonna work there uh, as soon as we have the contracts in place. So Javier Codero was uh, also CEO in PECOM and has uh, uh, yeah, an incredibly relevant background for exactly the, the work that he is now uh, doing in, in Venezuela. And uh, he will also be working as our COO in uh, Venezuela globally. But of course, the whole focus here, and that's an actual cost saving issue as well. We're not building a huge technical staff outside. We put our technicians where they should be, and that's in the field in, in uh, Venezuela. So with that, we also save some money, actually. Joranad Gross worked with us in DBO, a uh, fantastic uh, petroleum engineer, uh, speciality with the reservoir, but has also worked on, uh, on brownfield uh, um, in, in Brazil and in other places, worked in Bolivia. So a fantastic guy to have on board uh, with, with a broad, broad experience. And these two guys have a lot of fun together. Uh, one from Germany, one from Argentina, and working in Venezuela with the Brazilian Norwegian capital. You know, it's a fantastic situation <laughs> to be in. A lot of competence and fantastic, inspiring. Uh, okay, this is the deal we had. Uh, uh, I think what we have is basically now we have bought an exclusivity to take 24% of the field or 60% of, of the 40% company. So that becomes the 24%. So, uh, and this is a company B in uh, what you call this Empresa uh, Mistas in, uh, in Venezuela. Uh, I, yeah, I won't go through <coughs> explaining all that, but that's the standard in, in Venezuela. 
And uh, for this, we are paying uh, five million dollars or uh, in euros and another five to prolong the exclusivity. And why this thing with the exclusivity? Why this nine months plus 12 months? Because we planned to do this when there were sanctions. So basically our idea was to do this deal exactly as it is here, but then go to the Americans and get a license like Chevron has, has, uh, has received. And we would use our Illinois uh, company as a basis for that. And uh, we had, that had already been prepared. Actually, in, in hindsight, we, lost, uh, we, we wasted some money on American lawyers and uh, they are not cheap. But we, we made the plan based on what we knew at the time. And three days after we signed this deal, three days after we signed this deal, we had a notice that, and, and it was a rumor, but nobody thought they would be totally taken off, but basically then they were all lifted, and we could say, okay, then actually we don't need to, uh, to, to do it the same way anymore. So now our focus is on traditional due diligence, is really to, to get all the legal documents in place, and we are not concerned with, uh, with, uh, with the sanctions in the same degree anymore. I'm sure one of your questions can be, okay, but what happens if they come back and so on? So let me, let, yeah, I, I give you that question and I can answer that uh, later on. But uh, I think the total consideration is then the, those nine millions uh, and then additional 18 millions, uh, which will uh, basically follow uh, on production targets. So that's, you know, then you already have success, uh, success, uh, success and that's going to be, you know, cheap money in a way to, to, to pay uh, in that situation. Ridiculously low multiples on, on reservoir, on, on the reserves. There is no place in the world where you can dream about buying reserves for, for less than you know, $5 or something like that per, per barrel. So here we are talking about, you know, it's so low that you can't even, you can't, you can't, pro <laughs> can't pr pronounce them in a way. So, uh, so this is the deal. And I think now we are in a situation where we can do this faster. But of course, there is a bureaucracy in Venezuela and it's not working fast. So let's see, they are very eager. So the will is there to do things fast. The will is there to get us into the field, start working, but they need to sign the papers and, and, and that takes time. So uh, let's see. Morial Prom, just put it up here because it's a company I think you should look up. I think they had a fantastic increase in their share price uh, since they basically was uh, announcing that they now had the same deal as uh, with Chevron. Uh, basically meaning that they can go in and operate the field again and they can take control over the offtake. So that's how you, you are, the only trust you have in the system is that if you give me, I will do my work, I will, uh, I will uh, fix the wells, I will fix the compressor stations, I will do whatever is needed, you give me oil. And, and that's now kind of in, in the law and then you can do your own work, you know, that you will actually do the work yourself and you are paid in kind in oil. And that's what Moriprom had and uh, the news was very positively uh, received. I think if we had any valuation uh, close to what they had with their deal, uh, we should be twice uh, the size on the stock exchange. Uh, this is very a uh, lot of words here. I think what I'm <laughs> what I would say here is that we are very clear about how we work. We're gonna be very careful what we take over, understanding the environmental damages that potentially could be there, and we know there are lots in Venezuela as such. So that's gonna be a key focus. We have a dedicated team that will basically go in and basically document everything which is there. Then secondly, well, of course, we're gonna work with safety for the people that are uh, doing work every day and so on. And, uh, and then thirdly, we have absolute zero tolerance for anything like corruption. And I, I have said that in the, in the Venezuelan press already, was interviewed by Bloomberg in Venezuela, and I said, you know, if anybody has any ideas on this, this is how we work. We are listed in Sweden, I'm Norwegian, this is the way we work, and this is the way I've been worked over my whole life and everywhere I've been, and I've been in many uh, places. So, so we said there's zero tolerance. So I think that's important to put out there, and I, I think it's uh, one of the ways of kind of avoiding problems. It's just keep the guys out of the room, for, uh, you know, don't let them in. Don't uh, <laughs> let them get an idea that there is uh, even a possibility. Okay, so for the rest, I have another five minutes, yeah. So Papatera, I think I'll drop this. Uh, the production is developing uh, nicely. I think more importantly is that, uh, okay, what is Papatera? It's, uh, it's a project that was a disastrous project for uh, Petrobras and Chevron. And it's a fantastic acquisition for us. And uh, of course, how can it become fantastic for us? And, and it was a disaster for Petrobras and Chevron. Well, because they invested $7 billion and we, we bought it for $50 million. So that's a, that's a kind of a difference in that. 
and uh, and then with some urnouts, uh, you know, still this is uh, this is a fantastic acquisition. The reservoir in Papatera is was a big disappointment for Petrobras and Chevron. Basically, half of it disappeared, so they thought they had twice as much reservoir, so half of it disappeared, and then they also thought they could actually get very high productivity from the wells. So they created a monster of an FPSO and a monster of a platform that costed, uh, like I said, six, seven billion dollars. And of course, then with only 20,000 barrels uh, per day from some of the wells, it was too little. For us, having wells that come in here and produce 10,000 bar uh, barrels per day, 5,000 barrels per day, is fantastic investment. It's fantastic investment. The FPSO was built by BW Offshore. Uh, it, it works but it has been neglected by Petrobras. So there is a huge backlog on painting and, uh, and maintenance. We have problems with the boilers, we have problems with the, off with the offload system, we have problems with the tanks, we have problems with the gas generators, we have problems with the turbines. I mean, you name it, and there, there was a problem. So, but this is now being fixed, and you can see here on the upper graph there that we are basically from a, an extremely low level of 22%. They basically closed it in for almost uh, uh, a year. It's now up to 52, 67. I think that they will come up to something, say, uh, 60, 70, up to 80. And of course, I think that towards the end of the year, at least their ambition, and I'm in the board, I must say that I like what I see. It's a very structured plan. They're going to have a hotel, a flotel next door for three months. Uh, the production will probably shut down for two weeks to three weeks uh, for, for maintenance related to where you have to shut down the production but the rest of the time they will be producing but basically having people fixing uh, other parts of the of the FSO while they are producing so I think this is well planned uh, could have gone sooner perhaps but I'm quite happy to see that it's actually happening and it's happening in a responsible way uh, what we have then is the well uh, portfolio coming in now so what you have now is uh, production from uh, four wells 37, P uh, and 51, 52 and 16. And, uh, and that gives you 18,000 barrels per day. These 51 and 52 were the two first wells that Petrobras drilled after they kind of had the re-evaluation of you know, what had gone wrong because the rates were so low. And they made a new reservoir model. And these two wells have shown to produce more than what was simulated by their own uh, reservoir model. So these now, the reservoir is actually being a positive surprise and not a negative surprise. Uh, there are other wells now being connected where the ESP had uh, been worn out and there was no rig to replace. Now the, the rig is already working on the first. And there will be a second and a third uh, workover where you basically change the pumps. How can you know what oil comes out? Well, you know what it produced when it stopped. And I think here is more or less the same number. I think it's going to produce more, at least for a short period of time, because you had some buildup of pressure in uh, when it was closed down. And then you have the next well, which is a new well, P PT52. And then again, you can say, OK, big risk, new well. You don't know what's going to happen. This is a copy of the number seven well. And we know exactly what it was producing. I think this is a very conservative estimate on, on what came out of that well. So that means we are thinking about, you know, end of uh, 24, that we will produce up to 30,000 barrels, 28,000 barrels in, in Papatera. Not a bad number. Uh, Perua, I think I'll, I'll skip it. Uh, it's super important, gives you a nice cash flow, uh, an asset where that had an operating cost of 17, 18 million dollars when I was in the data, data room. And then I basically had the Arca solution to go there to get, to get with me. And I said, I want you to come and offer to me and you, you want you to operate this platform for three million dollars. Now the cost is 4.5. So uh, it wasn't so bad after all. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so this, I think this is a bit of how we have been able to, to create a lot of value. Of course, in addition to just reducing the cost that prolongs the, the lifetime uh, you know, tremendously because you, you hardly have any cost anymore on, on operating it. Uh, but then you also have a more positive reservoir. We, have, uh, we are reopening another well uh, again also here. So we get more volumes and lower costs. And that usually works uh, well for economy. Illinois, I, I think I yeah I think I touched upon that, so I think I'm going to close it. Oman, okay, yeah, uh, I think uh, we have uh, you know the lack of news. I think tells everything. Uh, there will be news next week. 
uh, don't put the expectation too high, but I am looking at uh, a proposal here or, uh, or yeah, I think you can accept, uh, expect that there will be some sort of value creation also coming out of Oman going forward. So that's at least what I'm working on and I'm going to Oman uh, after having been here, uh, I'm going straight to Oman. Uh, this is uh, what we actually believe comes out of a very conservative analysis, uh, analysis for, for the production out of the existing portfolio. I think Papatera here, and I forgot to tell that about Papatera, I see my time is out, but let me just take this uh, very quickly. Papatera is now uh, at the, has produced 2.6% uh, percent of the reserves, so two, more than 2 billion barrels. The, in the plan, which this is based on, by the, uh, the certified reserves in Papatera, uh, is about 10% of the recovery factor. Peregrino, that I was responsible for developing, which is today with the Equinor, had 17% uh, uh, recovery factor. That oil is a bit more uh, heavy, a bit more uh, viscous, and the reservoir is not, at least not in all areas, as good as we have in, in uh, Papatera. And the, that can be proven by, the, you see, look at the productivity in the, in the wells of Papatera, is significantly higher than what you uh, have in one, in any well in Peregrino. So we should actually get higher number than, than the 18, 17% that you have in Peregrino. And so far we have only certified 10. So in other words, the production curve should be <laughs> almost twice this just from Papatera. Uh, so I don't think necessarily because it will take more time and so on, but again, it's a little bit like Venezuela. It's a, like a lot of reserves and they will be developed and, and plans for that will come. So uh, I think that's it. You know, the strategy I think I've shown before uh, and I'm not going to, uh, yeah, and with anything else. Yeah, and unfortunately our time is really up. So We'll come back with questions another time. Yeah. So there will be another time with a lot more questions. So thank you very much to you for a very good presentation. And och till ni som lyssnar, tack så hemskt mycket för att ni har varit med oss här idag. Det här är vår sista bolagsdag som vi för i vår regi. Så att från och med nästa vecka så kommer vi gå in i Carnegie. Så att nästa bolagsdag kommer vara i Carnegies regi. Så att tack för den här tiden och tack för att ni ville komma hit och tack för att ni har lyssnat. På återseende. Tack.